יזכו לשנים רבות, נעימות וטובות ברוכים הבאים, מוריי ורבותיי, Welcome ladies and gentlemen to Kila Bet Nidarsh Tov, where tonight the community has gathered together, a night of unity for the Refuah Shtema, for the complete recovery of Michael Chaim Ben Ilanit, Vegan Binyamin Netanel Ben Rachat Tova. We're going to start off by a capital Tehilim. We're going to ask everyone to rise for a moment. We're going to all, Berov Am, together, do one chapter of Tehilim. And Bezat Hashem, Tefilatim, Tekbeh Baratzon. Shilam alo tesayin ay leharim, ayin yavo ezri. Ezri mim Adonai, ose shamayim varetz. אל ייתן למות רגליך, אל ינום שומריך. הנה לא ינום ולא יישן שומר ישראל. אדוני שומריך, אדוני צלך על יד ימינך. יומם השמש לא יככה וירח בלילה. אדוני שמרך מקור רע, ישמור את נפשך. אדוני ישמור את צאתך ובאיך מעתה ועד עולם. מי שברך אבותינו הקדושים אברהם, יצחק ויעקב, משה ואברהם דוד ושלמה, הוא ישלח רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנרף ושפועת הגוף, למחייל חיים בן אילנית וגם בנימין נתנה בן ברכה טובה, שהקדוש ברוך הוא ישלח רפואה שלמה. רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף, ימשך כל עולם עמו ישראל, חן יצור ונאמר אמן. בעזרת השם, מי שיהיה בשורות טובות מאורותיי, חזקים וברוכים for every single one of you for coming out tonight. בעזרת השם, מי שיהיה good news, every single one of us, we're asking, please continue praying from the bottom of your hearts. בעזרת השם, we should hear good news, we should hear בשורות טובות. We have, at the end of the program, a hundred ספרים, the secret to miraculous salvations that were sponsored anonymously, one per household on the condition that every single person that takes it, takes it upon themselves to read the 42-day program, בעזרת השם. Which will give us the chizuk, the imunah that we all need. The books are found right over here in the front. Rabbi, you'll make sure at the end of the program will be uh, given out. Again, only if for those that will bezat Hashem, use it and grow from it, and it will be for the refresh nimah. Also, I was asked to announce on behalf of the Shul Tov they have a beautiful new program they started. It's called Daily Chesed. They're going to have a grand opening event bezat Hashem very soon. A ladies and girls center next door over here of the Shul. Bezat Shem is going to be a Malcolm Torah for ladies to do chesed and to Bezat Shem grow. So stay, st- stay tuned for this Bezat Shem special, special uh, happening in our community. On behalf of Chazak, one very important announcement. There's obviously a lot going on. I just want to reiterate, Moriah Rabotai, it's the summer. People think, oh, the summer is vacation time. Let me go away. Let me go to, uh, many people go to deal. It became a thing in our community. Interesting. Uh, Poconos, mountains, all these different places. But when I wrote that, Chazak, the summer is the busiest season. It's uh, the time when we don't have time to sleep. And that's primarily because it's time to get every single Jewish child to yeshiva. We all know about the pandemic. I'm not talking about COVID. The pandemic that we have of over 10,000 Jewish kids. And I say this, my voice, uh, I get the chills. We still have so many thousands of our children Right over here in our own backyards, over here in Queens, in Long Island areas, Marvel, Thai, they go to public schools. Public schools, I have to tell you, is not a place for a Jewish kid. We say it loud and we say it clear. Nothing to be shy about. It used to be, oh, it's okay, I go to PS 164, I go to PS 1, this one, that. Today, Baruch Hashem, it's somewhat of an embarrassment. It is an embarrassment. If anybody and everybody has a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co worker that sends kids to public schools, we're on a mission. No child left behind. Every single Jewish child deserves Jewish education. Marav Odai, reach out to Chazak. We'll do everything and anything we can. Yomam Velayla, a whole PSTY division, public school to Yeshiva division. Baruch Hashem, over 1,200 Nishamot have already been saved. But there are thousands of more that we could save with every single person getting involved. It's not a one-man band. Everybody could do something. Nobody could do everything. So we ask everybody to please take this in mind. If you have anyone, give it a little bit of an extra push. Make that phone call. Reach out. If you don't feel re- comfortable reaching out to them, we'll do the job for you. Just do it, and Bezat Shem should be also for the Rafash Tema of the two special Nishamot Bezat Shem should hear Besor Tavot. Without further ado, it's our honor, it's our privilege to have a very dear friend, a rabbi that needs no introduction, Baruch Shem, he's been to our community. Let's give a round of applause to Rabbi Joey Haber Shalita. 
special thank you to Yisrael Nisano for helping arrange Michal Shem Siv and uh, the Nisav and uh, many other people in the community for arranging this whole program. Thank you to Tov, to Rabbi Tzadka, Shlita, Ebi. It's a tremendous honor to see this crowd here out on a Monday night in the summer. And I'm very much honored and appreciate to be here, to be here on behalf of Chazak, to be here in in, in this Kehila Tov, in this Bet Midrash Tov, and very much honored to be here for the Fuash these two wonderful young men. You know, these stories are still hard to wrap our head around. Two young boys, both not well for their own reasons, Minchayel Chaim ben Ilanit and Benjamin Netanel ben Brachatov. I spoke to one of their fathers just now, and just to think about what the families are going through in a time like this and what it is, all of a sudden the sun is, everything's great and then all of a sudden it's hard and then all of a sudden it's extremely hard. So tonight we're not just coming here to hear a speech, we're coming to do work and we're coming to hopefully change for the Fuash of these young men. And we're going to go and by the time the night is done, if we're going to turn to Borei Olam and say, Hashem, we need you to change these Gezerot. We need this time to be different. We need them to start to really go on the road to real, true, real, full recovery. With Hashem, we're asking something hard, so to speak. Not hard, but it looks like it's difficult. Something that's unique from you. Something that's not so natural from you. The way we're going to ask that is that we're going to do something that's not so natural ourselves. And we're going to walk out of here hopefully doing difficult work. And hopefully in that zakhut, Hashem will do unique, not so natural work and give these boys a complete refuash and them out very quickly. Bezat Hashem. Amen. Okay. So, first of all, it's also an honor to be here on behalf of Chazak. Chazak does incredible work. And, and you're right what you said before. Uh, I don't know if there ever was a place for a Jewish child in a public school. But in the last five years alone, the thoughts of what they're being taught and what their lives would become by being in a public school. Literally, if you save one, if you save two, if you save 10, if you save 20, save 200, every number, every single number is incredible. So Hashem should give Chazak the chizuk that they need to get the job done and get the job done completely. Okay, so this is a very weird speaking engagement for me. Should I tell you why this is weird? You ready for why this is weird? Usually when I go to speak, one of two things happen. Either they tell me, speak about whatever you want, or they tell me, speak about this. Those are the two options. Over here, in the last few days, I got all kinds of shitot. Speak about it, don't speak about this, speak about that, don't speak about that. People want to hear about it, people don't want to hear about it. So this is a unique experience for me. So I'm going to try to make some people happy and maybe some people not. And we're going to talk about a topic that I think sometimes people are not in the mood to hear about. And that's why some people said, Rabbi, just don't talk about it. And then other people said, Rabbi, how could you not talk about it? It's by far the biggest topic of our time. And it's by far the number one issue on people's minds. And if we talk about it last week, and we talk about it this week, there's still room to talk about it next week. So we're going to try to talk about the topic that was requested of us by some of the rabbis to be addressed tonight. And we're going to talk about it, I hope, in a way that is clear and understanding, general and specific at the same time. What we're talking about tonight is technology. And like I said, there are some people who say, keep talking about it. And there's a few people right now who are thinking, how do I get out of the room? <laughs> Our hope is that by the time we're done, both sides of the room will feel that the lesson was tangible and valuable. I'm going to start by reading a Gemara at the end of Masech Kedushin. I'm going to read this Gemara, I'm telling you in advance. It's one of the most unique sounding stories you've ever heard in your life. At some point in the middle of me reading the story to you, you're going to say, 
You really came from Deal all the way to Queens to tell this story? This is the Gemara you shared? It's going to sound like the most irrelevant, strangest story you ever heard in your life. And in the middle, you're going to roll your eyes and you say, what's he talking about? And then, hopefully, you're going to see how this story in the Gemara is so gorgeous. Hasve Shalom, to ever call a story in the Gemara strange. So gorgeous, so powerful, so relevant, so 2022. So here we go. Here's our story. You probably never even heard of the man in the story. His name is Plimo. Plimo says the Gemara, Masechet Kedushin, Dav Pe'alef. Plimo used to say every day, Gira Be'ena de Satan. He would say, like, you could put an arrow in the Satan's eyes. You could knock him out. One day, the Satan, which is the Yetzer Hara, the Satan dressed up like a poor man, says the Gemara. And that day was Male Yoma de Kippuri, Erev Yom Kippur. And so the Satan dressed as a poor man on Erev Yom Kippur. It comes Ata Kara Baba. He comes and he knocks on the door of Plimo. So Erev Yom Kippur, everyone knows, is a hectic and busy day. Plimo goes and opens the door to give the man a little bit of bread. He gives him a little bread. Afik Lerifta, he gives him bread. Amale, the poor man says, Yomakia Idna, on a day like today, everybody's Kuli Alma Gavai, everyone's inside Vana Avra, you're leaving me outside, you're leaving me outside, Erev Yom Kippur, you're leaving me outside. So Plimo says, you know, you're right. Come inside, no problem, come into the house. He brings the poor man into the house. And he gives him bread at the table, at the kitchen table. I don't know, do you, do you guys have housekeepers here? Yeah? As many as we have over there? We have a, it's funny, my daughter, like, she's embarrassed because I think we only have like one. So we have a housekeeper in Deal in the summer and we have another housekeeper in Brooklyn in the winter. So my daughter goes around saying we have two housekeepers. So if you ever had a housekeeper, you know, the housekeeper needs to eat. So you feed them like on the kitchen table. Everyone's eating at the dining table. You feed them at the kitchen table. So Plimo gives this poor man food on the kitchen table. Amale, yomakia inna. The poor man who's really the satan says, on a day like today, everyone's sitting on the dining room table, Erev Yom Kippur, having a beautiful meal. You're leaving me on the kitchen table? So Plimo says, okay, come, sit on the dining room table, sit with us. Habayativ, he's sitting at the table, this poor man, and all of a sudden, Malen Avshe Shichana Vekivi. All of a sudden, his body is full of boils and pus is coming out of his body. So, and he's doing disgusting things. So Plimo says, sit up. What are you doing? You're, you're, uh, disgusting! Sit up! The man says, this poor man says, I can't sit up. Give me a cup. Give me a nice cup. I I'll sit up. So Plimo comes, gives him a nice silver cup, gives the poor man a silver cup who has boils and pus and phlegm and I don't know what's coming out. The man starts spitting into the cup. Are we at the point yet where you're saying, what in the world is Rabbi Heber talking about? Are we there yet? Again, I am reading the Gemara word for word. I'm specifically opening the Gemara and reading the words inside so you know I'm not exaggerating and changing any of the details at all. Good. So he starts spitting in the cup. Plimo gets upset at him. He says, what are you doing? All of a sudden, this poor man who's really the Satan, who's spitting in the cup, has got pus all over him, all of a he's at the dining room table. He peels over and dies. Umit. And he dies. Word goes out across the town that Plimo killed someone. Because he had a guest. And all of a sudden the guest is dead. Plimo Katal Gavra. Plimo Katal Gavra. Word all over town. Plimo murdered someone on Erev Yom Kippur. So Plimo runs away to the outhouse. Back in the day he'd run away outside the town. And he goes to the outhouse and he falls on the floor. He's in extreme pain. 
This poor man who's supposed to be dead, who's really the Satan, shows up at the outhouse and shows up with Plimo and says, by the way, it was me, it was the Satan the whole time. So Plimo says, what were you doing? He says, it's because you said, Gira be'ena de sitna, because you said an arrow in the eyes of the Satan. He says, what should I have said? He said, you should have said, Hashem of mercy, please help me with the Satan. And the Gemara ends. I read this Gemara numerous times and said, wow, this is one of those Gemara that you have no idea what it's talking about. Until you understand how life works. And if you understand how life works, you'll realize that the story I just told you, with all of those details that sound so peculiar to your simple ears, in a few minutes you're going to realize that this story is so relevant so true, it's happening daily. Here's what the Gemara is saying. Plimo used to say, arrow in the eyes of the Satan, which means, the Yetzir Hara, I don't have to worry about him, I have him covered. And the Gemara is telling you how the Yetzir Hara works. Here's what he does. He dresses up like a poor man. Meaning he starts off Innocently, whatever Yetzir Hara we're talking about, you can name anyone. It could, be, it could be any area, it could be a drink, it could be a drug, it could be a, 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 a cigarette, it could be an e-leg, it could be a, a, an addiction, it could be, a, it could be seeing an inappropriate picture, it could be gambling, and it could be technology. It comes to the door, knocks on the door with innocence, and says, please, can I come into your house? Just, you know, you'll get yourself an iPhone. It'll save, make things easier. You'll get ways. It'll take you from Deal to Queens. Won't be hard. Save you so much time. You want to coach a restaurant, you can look it up. Knocks on the door with innocence. So you tell the Yetzirah, no problem, come into my house. But you sit on the kitchen table. You're not in my life. You're just going to be over there on the side. I'm going to have one WhatsApp chat in order to talk to my kid in Israel so they can send pictures of my grandson. You're sitting at the kitchen table. You're not in my life. And then, next thing you know, the Yetzirah moves to the dining room table. And next thing you know, you're on 40 WhatsApp chats <laughs> with every random fake news video man has ever created is in your, in your pocket. And then... All of a sudden, the Yetzirah starts to get you to do weird things. Like this poor man's pus and boils. All of a sudden, you're on your phone, you wanted to go to sleep at 11.30 at night, and now you turn around, it's 1.45 in the morning. And you're like, what did I just do for the last two hours? I don't even remember what I did. I don't, I think... I started because I wanted to buy a pair of shoes and I don't know where I've been since then. And then what happens is you say, you know what, this is too much. I didn't want this. I didn't never expected that it was going to consume me this much. When it came knocking on the door, I never agreed to this. I agreed to WhatsApp for pictures of my granddaughter once a week because I don't see my granddaughter. I'm helping. My fact, my children are living in Israel. He's learning in Kolel by me having WhatsApp. I'm supporting Kolel because I'm allowing them to stay there because I can see my granddaughter. That's why I let him in the house. I didn't even realize when he went from the kitchen table to the dining room table. And I didn't realize when all of a sudden I'm up three nights in a row watching things I never expected to. And then what happens is I turn around to the person next to me and I said, I need some help. You got to help me. I need a cup. As Plimo's story, I need a cup. Please give me something to help me. Someone's got to take my phone from me. Get me a filter. Do something to help me. And then what happens is I take the help and I spit it into it. Like this poor man spitting in the cup. Next thing you know, I find my way around it. I find my way doing some tricks with it. And I got the help and I'm spitting in the cup of the help. 
And all of a sudden, which lo alenu should never happen, all of a sudden, a man or woman's reputation could even be hurt and destroyed. Plima all of a sudden has a dead man in his house and the world thinks he killed him. All of a sudden someone sends something they shouldn't be sending or they're seeing things they shouldn't be seeing. And all of a sudden their marriage is in places they never imagined it to be. And they're like, what happened? How did I get here? Because we're in a time where the enemies, the physical enemies, have never been easier. We don't live in a holocaust, we don't have pogroms, we don't live in Middle Eastern countries that hate us. The physical enemies, for the most part, across the globe, for the Jewish people, yes, you'll hear about a, a random attack where two people are killed every now and then, but for the most part, our physical enemies are almost totally at bay. But the Satan dressed like a poor man has never been dancing in our home more than today. Never. And he got us convinced. And if any person had a home that was somewhat safe from technology, COVID came and it became a mitzvah to have it in your house. Obligation. What are you going to do? You need to know how to sanitize the plastic bag before it comes into the house. You remember the lunacy that we watched during that time? And all of a sudden it came right back into the dining room. Our message here tonight is that we are up against an enemy that none of us were ever prepared for. If you're at my age, which means you remember life without it, and now you see life consumed with it, you can't believe what happened to us. You ask yourself almost every day, how did this happen? Every day you say, what's going on? I was never prepared. I was never equipped for this. And if you're younger than me and you were kind of born into this, you can't even imagine life without it. Like, what are you talking about? When I talk to my kids about the old days, I'm talking 30 years ago. They're like, Daddy, you, you rode in a horse and buggy and you had beepers. You were weird people, olden days, black and white. The grass was probably black and white in your day. But what's happening today across the religious Jewish world is the awareness of this topic has never been stronger. And only three, four years ago, people would roll their eyes about this topic. Right now, everyone is paying attention. And every, you cannot call yourself a from religious Jew if you're not concerned deeply about this. You can't be a firm religious Jew without putting tefillin on in the morning. You can't be a firm religious Jew without being deeply concerned about this topic. And it's a topic that's being discussed across the firm globe. So yes, there are some people who are not in the mood to hear about it. But a vast majority of people who are aware of what's happening in the world and happening in society are saying we can't talk about it enough. Because we're so consumed, and this man's in our house, sitting at our table, embarrassing us, and embarrassing our lives, and has, gripping our children, and we need to find some way to get some relief on this topic. So the first step that every person who wants to be part of the Jewish religious kehillah, the first step is clear awareness. Like the Satan told Plimo. He said to him, you should be saying, Hashem, please help me. Every one of us has to have in our mindset, Hashem, I am at your mercy. This is difficult. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But no thought, any person who thinks, oh, I've got this, is delusional. Maybe you could put out a filter that will save you from the worst things in the world. 
But you, there's almost nothing you could do that you could say, I got this under control completely. So the first step is an incredible awareness of how dangerous this is and how dangerous this is to your life. I don't care what religious level you're in. How dangerous this is to your life and a preparedness to do something about it. A preparedness to say that, you know what, I know what he's talking about. Whether you're a social media person, whether you're a WhatsApp person, whether you're a Netflix person, whether you're a YouTube person, whether you're a buying on Amazon nonstop person, whatever thing is your thing, you got to stop and say, I am aware this is a big deal, this is a challenge, this is not how I, no one warned me. I wasn't prepared for this. I'll give you a kind of example of what I mean. About 25 years ago, I used to live in Lakewood. For about 10 years, I lived in Lakewood. I learned in Cornell in Lakewood. The night I moved into my new house, anyone here know Lakewood? An area called Forest Park. You know Forest Park? So I moved in. This was when it was first built. Like, there was no one on that side of the world. Now it's the center of attention there. But anyhow, I moved into my house, and that night, that night, uh, we were hungry, you know, day, moving day, there's no food, no one's cooking dinner. So we were hungry. I'm a big snacker. Anyone who listens to my classes knows I like to snack a lot. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go to the store and buy some snack. I found a store around the corner, a regular 24-hour, not really kosher store, but they had wise potato chips, soda, whatever I needed. So I walked into the store, I bought some stuff, maybe I got some water to make some healthy people happy, but for the most part, candy and stuff. And as I'm walking out of the store, I see a full section of inappropriate magazines. I paid for the stuff, walked out of the store and said to myself, I will never walk back into this store again. Do I think if I went there every week, do I think I ever would have purchased one of those things? Has shalom. No, I don't. But I also think I don't need to put myself in a situation where I even know that it's there. I'll buy snacks someplace else, even late at night. And I lived there for 10 years, and never once did I walk into the store again. That, I'm telling you the story to make this point, that there's times where you stop and you say, I'm not going to figure out, I got it, I don't got it, I'm strong enough, I never would do it, I'm a yeshiva, a younger man, and I'm no risk, it's risk, out. Story, I, I got, I'm not dealing with this story, case closed, I'm out. Now, you know what, that's very easy to do with a 24-hour store in Lakewood, because there's a thousand other stores you can buy snack in, you don't really need a 24-hour store. But it's not so easy to do with an iPhone. And it's not so easy to do an iPhone where you do work on it and you respond to emails. And you do have your granddaughter in Israel who's sending you pictures that you do want to see. And you are getting messages from people that at times are very important. So it's not so easy to just say, out. I want to tell you another story in the Gemara. This story is much shorter. Not as unique sounding but incredibly shocking. I still can't believe that the Gemara actually told us this story. It's on the same page in Masech Kiddushin. And here's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that there was one day that there was, Rabbi Akiva was, um, was laughing about people that do sins, the people that fall into sins. What are they falling into sins for? Why are they sinning? The Gemara writes this, Rabbi Akiva, you heard of Rabbi Akiva? You know Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest Tanaim to ever live. Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara writes, was passing by a tree. And on top of the tree was a beautiful girl. The Gemara says this inside. Rabbi Akiva climbed halfway up the tree to sin. And halfway up the tree, a voice came out from Shamaim and said, Rabbi Akiva, we're going to let go of the temptation 
and we're going to protect you. But if we didn't let go of the temptation, we could have made Rabbi Akiva worth two cents. And when I read the Gemara, I get embarrassed with Rabbi Akiva. Like, why are you sharing this story? If this story happened, keep it private. Why are you sharing it? I think the answer in the Gemara says a very similar story about Rabbi Meir. Why are you sharing these stories? I think the answer is the Gemara is trying to tell you, don't be shy about the fact that there's a Yetzir Hara. Don't ever think that you're above a Yetzir Hara. Because there's no one alive today that's greater than a Biakiva. So if you're not greater than a Biakiva, and he even, if the Yetzir Hara wanted, he even could have been taken, then for sure you can. So there's nothing embarrassing, and there's nothing uh, guilty feeling about the fact that you're susceptible. It means you're human. I saw someone last night, he says, my son has everything, he has a flip phone. He says, because I know that when he had an iPhone, his son's a very good kid. He says, I know when he had an iPhone, there were bad things happening. I said, I want to tell you the truth. I said, if someone has an unfiltered iPhone, a young boy, 20, 18, 19 years old, guaranteed bad things are happening. Not likely, not probably, guaranteed. And if they're not happening, you have a bigger problem. Are you understanding? You're buying what I'm selling? You understanding what I just said? You know, it's, it's automatic. And that's what the Gemara is trying to tell you. It's not telling you stories about a few crazy wild people that had a Yitzhara. It's telling us about rabbis that we quote every day. Obviously, we're not on that level. And obviously, the, the, the Yitzhara that they had is not something we can really identify with. But the Gemara is telling you the story so that you do identify with it. I'm going to give you another example of how deep it's gone through technology. And this may not be relevant to anyone in the room. But I'm telling it to you just to create some awareness of how fast this happened. Do you know what happened on January 8th, 2022? That's whatever that is, six, seven months ago. What happened on January 8th, 2022? You know what happened on January 2022? You know what happened? I'll tell you what happened on January 8th, 2022. No one knows. You're not historians. Ja I'll tell you what happened. What? No, I don't know about shootings. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what happened on January 8th, 2022. Sports gambling became legal in New York. A nice, cute little fact. You might have heard about it, and you moved on. What you may not have known is that there was more gambling on devices, on our smartphones, in New York in the month of January than any other state in the history of this country, including Vegas. One month. Today, in this country, every young boy, every 18, 19 year old, I don't know who's playing tonight, but they have $10 on this guy. Three days after January 8th, I gave a shiur to a bunch of young, wonderful boys. Wonderful boys. I'm in this shiur and the boy keeps saying, He's looking at his phone. I'm like, what's going on? He says, Chris Paul has only 10 points, 4 rebounds. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you saying? He said, nah, I have $5 on this guy. I, I said, he's not on the Knicks. He's not on the Nets. Who is? Yeah, he's a basketball player, I think, on Phoenix. Phoenix, a team in Phoenix. And, and, and I got $5 riding on this guy. This sports gambling... I cannot tell you how much it's changed the world. Let me try to describe to you how much money they're making off of your sons. Can I describe this to you? They have offers. Like the Super Bowl. Before the Super Bowl, they had an offer. Here was the offer. Draft Kings or whatever the other names are. Here was their offer. It was Super Bowl 56. So if you bet $5... On something like which team's going to win, which means you have a 50-50 chance of winning, right? $5 on just which team is going to win. They'll pay you back 56 times the amount for Super Bowl 56. 
56 times the amount. Do you understand that? Bet $5, and they'll pay you back, what's that? It's about $300. Now you stop and you say to yourself, which company, why would someone tell me to give them $5 and have a 50% chance of them giving me back $300? Like imagine if you went to, to Walgreens, and they said, buy a toothpaste, and we're not going to tell you which one, either Colgate or Crest. But if you buy the right one, we're going to give you $300. Would that ever happen? So why does Walgreens never do it? Give me $300 for Colgate or Crest, but sports books or DraftKings, why do they do it? Because they know how dumb you are. Because they know that once you win that $300, you're going to bet it all back again. And then you're going to lose some of it. And you're going to say, there's no way. I was up $300 yesterday. Now all of a sudden, I'm down $200. And then you're going to bet again. And then you're going to bet again. They know this. They know that by the time they are finished with you, you will be down so much money and you won't even notice. That's why they do it. Let me tell you how confident they are in how dumb you are. Let me tell you how confident they are, excuse me for being so clear, but how confident they are in how much of your money they're going to take. These companies, DraftKings, Sports, I'm forgetting the other ones, do you know how much taxes they have to pay? They have to pay 51% taxes on their earnings. That means they're a company that is going to give you $300 for free and what they make from you, they're going to have to give away half of it and they're still in the business because they still know they're going to make money. They know that you are so dumb that you're going to give them so much money that even after they gave you $300 and even after they paid 50% taxes, they're still going to make so much money. Because of fools who think that I have my hands on the Yetzir Hara, I got this taken care of. You're lucky you're not as young as the people who are susceptible to this. That's all I could say. In fact, that night, when I was giving a shiur to those boys, they're all 12th graders in high school. Maybe it was like 15, 20 boys. I said, boys, in this room, and none of them were crazy wealthy. I know you think, no, none of them were crazy wealthy. I said, boys, in this room, how much money is going to be bet on the Super Bowl? They looked around. They said, Rabbi, probably about $15,000. And not one of them has a job. Are we kidding? We need to have our eyes wide open to stop and realize that we are susceptible. And on a night like tonight, our goal, if we want to ask Hashem to give a for these two young men, you came out on a beautiful summer night to ask Hashem for the of these two young men, Hashem's not just looking for a token chapter of Tehillim. That's easy. Hashem's saying, if you want me to shake it up, I need you to shake it up. And shake it up means I need you to stop, recognize your weakness, admit your weakness. If it be Akiva and it be Meir Khan, you can also admit your weakness. Acknowledge the fact that the Satan dressed like a poor man is at your dining room table and stop and make a clear decision about this. We were going to hand out papers, I don't think we're able to in the end, but a clear decision. What are you going to do tangibly to start the battle against this guy? What are you going to do tangibly? What filters are you putting? Maybe change your phone. Maybe get rid of delete apps on your phone. Maybe delete supports of social media, all of social media on your phone. What are you going to do tangible? I know it's not so easy. I'm not coming here thinking it's easy. I'm not telling you I'm some rabbi telling you, oh, this is just, of course, it's to your, it's to no, I know how hard. 
But I also know how, di- how much he's winning and I know the impact he's having on us. For the last few minutes of this speech, I don't know, what time am I supposed to go to? Anyone here have a number? The whole night. The whole night. <laughs> I'm not sure if the men agree. What time should I go to? 15 more minutes? 10 minutes? Good? Half hour? Okay, thank you. Here's what I want to share with you to, for the last, whatever it is, 10, 15 minutes. Because I was asked to share this specifically. A month ago, I was called to speak at one of the biggest gathering of, from women, maybe in American history. There was an Asifa gathering called Nikadesh at the Prudential Center. You know where the Prudential Center is? It's in New Jersey, where the devils play, 20,000 seats. And 20,000 women came together to be inspired on this topic. And they asked me to be the opening speaker. Excellent. You were there? Yeah. I did okay? Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> they couldn't figure out how to put me on the sign, so they put Rabbi Yosef, quote unquote, Joey Haber. <laughs> so. I could, I could be quotes. It's going to be quotes, so I'm going to do it now. So tell some of it now. And I spoke in the full yeshivish, my hat was on, full yeshivish. I said, it's an honor to speak to the Noshim Sidkaniyais of Awadar. <laughs> okay? I could give it to you in full yeshivish also if you want. But I'm going to tell you some of what we said that night on this topic. Because I hope that you'll find it somewhat inspiring. And this is how we'll conclude. And I hope... In the next 10-15 minutes, as you're sitting in your seat and thinking, I hope you're going to come up with something tangible. Please don't get up from your chair until you have something tangible that you're going to do in your technology life. Everyone in this room has different levels. Everyone in this room has different needs. Some people really have to do a lot of business on their phone. I'm acknowledging that. But everyone here is probably crossed lines that they did never wanted to cross. I don't mean catastrophic ones. I mean mid-level ones. I mean time-wasting and distracting ones. Something that you're going to do tangibly, that you're going to make this, you're going to win this war. Because it's nothing short of that. That night I said I have three questions. Why are we here? What needs to change? And why does it need to change? First, why are we here? We're here because we were fooled. We were fooled. The Gemara writes in Masechet Yuma, Amar Rabbi Chamar, Rabbi Chamar says in the name of Bar Chanina, in the son of Bar Chanina, Mehem In the days of our forefathers, throughout our history of our people, Lord Parasha Yeshiva Imahem, they never had Yeshiva leave them. When Abraham Avinu was had a yeshiva, Abraham Avinu zaken ve'yoshev be'yeshiva, and it quotes a pasuk. Yitzchak zaken ve'yoshev be'yeshiva, and it quotes a pasuk. Yaakov Avinu zaken ve'yoshev be'yeshiva, he also had a yeshiva. The Jewish people in Mitzrayim, yeshiva imahem. Bamidbar, yeshiva imahem. And every generation they had a yeshiva. Here's my question. Why do you call it a yeshiva? You should really say what the Gemara is trying to say is that throughout each generation the Jewish people had Torah learning. Why do you should say Tamut Torah Imahem? Why the word yeshiva? I think because the word yeshiva means not just a place where you learn. Yeshiva is a zone. Yeshiva is a bubble. Yeshiva is a mentality of Yeshuv Hadat and calmness and tranquility. And today we've lost Yeshuv Hadat. Yeshuv Hadat is gone and happiness with your lot is fading. You know why? Because we were fooled. No one ever told us when they invented the car phone that we would never have a peaceful drive again. 
No one ever told us when they invented the mobile phone that we would never be able to pick up our heads again. No one ever told us when they invented text message that our fingers would remain glued to this device impossible to remove. No one ever told us when they invented the camera on the phone that our eyes would never experience things by ourselves. Instead, we'd have to experience it through a device. <laughs> we were fooled. No one ever told us. No one ever told us when they invented social media that we would be gripped by jealousy and anxiety and at times even deep depression. No one ever told us. No one ever told us when they created notifications that our heart would beat different when the light flickers on the phone. No one ever told us when they created Instagram that what Silicon Valley was really doing is spending billions of dollars and how to take more and more of your brain. Your brain is not, you're not the customer. Your brain is the product. No one ever told us that they literally are harvesting, how do I get more of your brain? How do I get more of your time? How do I get more brain space? No one ever told us. We were fooled. No one ever told us when WhatsApp was created that soon after there would be this thing called fake news that would spread all across our lives. And now when a pandemic comes, all of a sudden, the world would be in chaos. Simply because of WhatsApp. Do you see this video on WhatsApp? No, I saw the other one on WhatsApp. This one said it's safe. This one said one mask. The other one said two. The other one said three. The other one said none. The other one said only for old people, only for young people, only for weird people. It was... <laughs> no one ever told us. You know, as a young boy, I went to Lakewood, I mentioned Lakewood before, I went to Lakewood Cheder in the 1970s and 80s. Thank you very much. Amen. And the town of Lakewood was a place of Yishuv Hadat. There was a calmness. And now you look across the from world, whether we're in Brooklyn, LA, Chicago, Queens, Manhattan, New Jersey, and the Yishuv Hadat is gone. I want to give you a real example. I once gave a class to a group of young girls, maybe they're 15 years old. And I asked the girls, how much time do you spend on your smartphone every day? This is all part of that speech. How much time do you spend on your smartphone? So the girls, you know how like, they always think, oh, the teacher thinks it's more than it is. So the girls said, uh, you're probably thinking, we probably spend two hours and you probably think it's four hours a day. I said, you know what girls, don't ask me. Your phones are right there on the window, so it's in the middle of a school class. Go get your phones. There's something on the phone that could show you the average amount of time you spend on the phone a day. Let your phones testify. They each got their phones, and I had them write it down on a piece of paper. The first girl says she spends, in an average week, 70 hours and 34 minutes. 87 hours and 56 minutes. 85 hours and 16 minutes. This girl is 11 hours a day at Shabbat, she doesn't use it. 8 hours and 11 minutes a day, 7 hours a day. One girl wrote that she spends 30 hours a week just on TikTok. They couldn't believe what their own phones were testifying. And they all said, we're going to change, we're going to change. <laughs> they changed. They went down 10% for four days. Because this thing is gripping us. We were fooled. No one ever told us 
that we would be a slave. Do you remember the last time you sent someone a text message and you were waiting up at night in a cold sweat, waiting to see the light flicker that you got a response and you asked yourself, when did I agree to become a slave to this thing? That's why we're here, because we were fooled. So what needs to change? Here's what needs to change. And ladies and gentlemen, it's as true tonight as it was then. Here's what needs to change. Our approach to technology has been, we talk about what we need from a gosh mute standpoint. I need it for business. I need it for friends. I need it for social. I need to take care of my father. Whatever reason that we say. And then we fit the ruchaniyut between the cracks. That has to shift. It now has to be what's our ruchaniyut needs and we'll fit the gashmias between the cracks. We'll figure out how to do business, how to make sure we could reach the people we need to reach. But the first, the decision, the priority, the perspective has to come from the ruchaniyut angle. You know, when you talk to people about technology, half the conversation is about, well, is it right? Is it wrong? This is allowed. It's not allowed. It is allowed. It's not allowed. And the other half of the conversation is, Rabbi, I know you're right, but it's just difficult. So here's my question for you. Since when has difficult ever stopped us? Imagine if difficult stopped Sarai Menu when her son was being taken to the top of a mountain to be slaughtered. Imagine if difficult stopped Rivka Menu when she had to figure out how to navigate a beracha for her son Yaakov. Imagine if difficult stopped Rachel Menu from giving the secrets to her sister and allowing her to do the greatest zechut that would last for thousands of years later. Imagine if difficult stopped Miriam from watching her brother from behind the grass. Imagine if difficult stopped Chana from going and finding a way to pray in Shiloh to have one of the greatest sons to ever live. Imagine if difficult stopped Chana when her seven sons were being taken. Imagine if difficult stopped Esther from walking into the palace of the king. Imagine if she said, I'm sorry I can't go in. It's just too difficult. Since when has difficult ever stopped us? Imagine if difficult stopped the Jews from Spain from leaving when there was an immigrant position. Imagine if difficult stopped the mothers in Europe when their children were being taken and Haskalah was taking over their minds. Imagine if mothers said, what am I going to do? Just learn that nonsense. It's too difficult for me to stop you. Imagine if difficult stopped the mother in the ghettos from feeding her child and finding a way to get them food. Imagine if difficult stopped our grandparents from keeping Shabbat in America in the 60s and the 70s. Difficult. All the people in the generations I just mentioned, all of those people that failed, we're disappointed in them to this day. But those people that succeeded, we hold them in the exalted places to this day. And I'll bet you, if you lived in America in the 1960s, you could rationalize why you need to work on Shabbat. I, of course you could have. You could say, well, you have to understand. I have children, and I need a panasah, and I'm not going to do melachah deoraita. I'm going to go on a train. I'm not going to write. I'm going to go to business. I'm just going to talk. I'm not going to actually sell. I'm just going to help. I'm going to watch. I just don't want to get fired. I'm going to come home. I'm going to do a klachayad. I'm going to do the melachah like this. And you have to understand and have children. It's a kanat short for my kids. I bet you there were people back then that were convinced it was a mitzvah to go to work on Shabbat. Because you could rationalize anything. And those people, their grandchildren today, have a tree in their house in December. We're proud of those that endured and we're disappointed in those that failed. That's what needs to change. Because those challenging times are not times we overcame. We didn't survive the ghetto. The ghetto built us. In fact, I read this stat the other day, uh, that a month ago. Do you know what percentage of Jews in America kept Shabbat in the 1960s? 
four percent. Ninety-six percent of Jews rationalize their way to a job. And our from Jewish world is built on that four percent. So the next time you go tell your grandma who sacrificed for Shabbat, I think about my grandfather who sacrificed to keep Shabbat. Let me go tell him, I I'm sorry, I need to keep my iPhone because I got to get the replays on ESPN at night. I have to buy my daughter a camp bag. Challenge has never stopped Am Yisrael. So why would it stop us now? Technology is not just the Nisayon Hador, it's not just the Satan of the door and the Yetzir Hara of the door. Technology is the opportunity of our generation. The opportunity for every person in their home to draw a line in the sand and say, am I part of the team of Ruchaniyut or am I part of the team of Gashmiyut? I know you have needs. I know this business that needs to be done. I understand. And with the concessions you need to make, you make. I got it. But what is dictating? What's setting the, the, the conversation in your house? Is it Ruchaniyut or Gashmiyut? And I know it's scary. Let me tell you another little story. I told it that night, a little story. We're going to end in five minutes. We have time? Thank you. There was once a man. This is for any person who's scared. Any person who's scared to make the kind of moves we requested tonight. There was once a man who committed a crime. He was taken to the king, and the king said, you need to be executed. You need to be hung. So, the man says, please, no, please. Man, the king says, I'm sorry, you committed a crime, that's the consequence. Finally, the man's begging. The king says, I'll give you one. I'll tell you what. I'll give you a choice. Either you get hung by those gallows, or you could take what's ever behind that. And the king points to two humongous dungeon-like doors. He says, either the gallows or whatever's behind those doors. So the man starts to think, what's behind those doors? I don't know. Maybe there's ferocious, hungry animals, lions. Maybe there's, there's men with Chinese torture. Maybe there's giants with axes in their hands. He says to the king, I, I can't. I'm too scared. I'll take the gallows. King says, okay, that's what you chose. King brings him to the gallows, puts the noose on his head. And the man says, just before it happens, can you just tell me what's behind those doors? King says, I'm sorry you made a choice. He says, just tell me what's behind the doors. King says, I'll tell you the truth. Every person I give the choice to chooses the gallows. He says, just your highness, I'm not going to live much longer. Just could you tell me what's behind the doors? He says, okay, I'll tell you. He says, you want to know what's behind those two doors? What's behind those doors is freedom. But you were too scared to open the doors, so you chose this. For every man and woman who has the guts and the courage to make a real choice, I know it's scary, but you know what's behind those doors? You know what's behind that choice? Freedom. And here's why it needs to change. And we conclude with this. Amar of Yeshua ben Levi, the Mishnah says in the sixth parak of Pirkei Avot, yom vayom, every day a voice comes out of Har Chorev and it says, Oy lahem la beriyod me Torah. Sad are the people that disgrace the Torah. They're called Nazuf. And then the Mishnah quotes a pasuk. They're like a nezim zahav be'af chazir. They're like a golden ring in the nose of a chazir, in the nose of a pig. What do you mean like a golden ring in the nose of a chazir? What does it mean? What it means is Hashem says to the Jewish people, I gave you a chance for gold. And you put it on a hazir. Hashem says to a person who doesn't choose a life of Torah, He says, I gave you the greatest gift. I gave you a life of Kiddushah. And you traded it in to play in the mud. We were tasked as Jews to step up 
to the challenge. We were tasked by Nikadesh. We were tasked to say, I want to live holy. Let me give you this one more story. There was a famous one. There was once a, a, an eagle and the eagle's nest and there was an egg on the nest on the top of a tree and the egg rolled out of the nest and fell into a chicken coop. The egg eventually hatched and out came this little chick in the chicken coop. So she sees herself around the other chickens. So she says, what am I doing here? They said, no, you're a chicken. She says, but why am I, why are my wings black? You're a chicken. Come on. Let's, you're a chicken. Let's go. We eat chicken stuff. We do chicken stuff. She said, like, but one second, but why do I have wings? Nah, that's nonsense. Ignore that. Chicken. You're like a chicken. Let's eat like a chicken. And so this eagle started bouncing around like little chicks, like the other chickens in the coop, eating the stuff that chickens eat and doing the stuff that chickens do. Until one day the mother eagle, eagle came flying down and tells her little baby, get on my back. She says, why should I get on your back? She says, because you're my, you're my child. What are you, your child? I'm a chicken. No, no, no. Child, get on my back. So this little baby eagle jumps on the mother's back and the mother starts to fly. And the baby says, what's happening? The mother says, just watch. And she starts to fly and she says, this is what eagles do. We fly. And the mother then drops off the baby eagle on top of the mountain. And the baby says, what do I do now? The mother says, you do what eagles do. You fly too. We're eagles in a world of chickens. The world doesn't understand that we were born to fly. We were given the ability, we were given the challenge, we were given the opportunity to achieve holiness that the rest of the world doesn't understand. They don't mean bad, they just don't understand. They don't understand what Kiddusha means. They don't understand what it means to fly like an eagle. They don't understand the holiness of freedom. They don't understand. This is our job. I'll tell you another story. This is our job. There's a great rabbi. His name was Dov Ben-Michol ben Weissmandel. He was a survivor of the Holocaust, very well known. He had five children before the Holocaust, and all five of his sons were killed in the Holocaust. Following the Holocaust, he remarried and had five more sons. At the bris of his fifth son, he says, here's my job. He says, I had five children who were killed al Kiddush Hashem. Now I have five new children. My goal with the five new children is this. Nekadesh et shimcha ba'olam. They say this in, in, in Kiddush every day. Nekadesh et shimcha ba'olam. Hashem, your name should be sanctified with my five sons in this world. Keshem shemaktishim oto b'shemem arom. Just like my other five sons are sanctifying your name in the loftiest of places. There were generations that were told to die al Kiddush Hashem. Hashem's asking this generation to live al Kiddush Hashem. Nekadesh shemcha ba'olam. Let's make His name holy and live al Kiddush Hashem in this world. And you know what? When the world says, oh, but you need it. And you, how could you live without it? And how are you going to get the WhatsApp? And, and you have to be able to see your social media. And you have to be able to get likes. And you have to do things on Instagram. And you have to follow this. And you have to be involved in this. You know what? They're right. For chickens. <laughs> They're right for them. But we were told to fly. And we're asked to live different. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't come here to give you restrictions. I didn't come here to make your life difficult. I didn't come here to ask you to say no to the phone. I ask you to say yes to your family. I'm not asking you to say no to the internet. I'm asking you to say yes to your holy children that want your attention. I didn't ask you to say no to a smartphone. I'm asking you to say yes to a smart life. I'm not asking you to say no to texting. I'm asking you to say yes to looking up. 
I'm not asking you to say no to social media, but instead to say yes to energy and happiness and productivity. I'm not asking you to say no to WhatsApp. I'm asking you to say yes to freedom. I'm asking you to say yes to your husband and say yes to your wife. Say yes to focus. Say yes to happiness. Say yes to Ruchan Yut. Say yes to holiness. And now I'm going to really tell you my final story. <laughs> There was once, and they said this is a true story. The king of France, all the kings of France were known as King Louis. King Louis XVI is the most famous. There was a rebellion, and they took him and his wife to the guillotine. Marie Antoinette, you know the story. <coughs> the rebels had a problem. After they killed Louis and his wife, Louis had a son. What was the son's name? Louis. <laughs> Louis was about eight or nine years old. The rebels didn't know what to do. Kill him. We can't kill. He's a little boy. But to keep him alive, one day, he's going to fight us and take over France. We can't kill him. He's too young. But we can't keep him alive. He's too dangerous. So they came up with a solution. They said, we're going to bring him to a faraway island. This island has all, every delicacy, every indulgence you could want, every drink, every food, every temptation. They put little Louis on the island with a few guards, and they said, Louis, do whatever you want. Just have as much fun, eat everything, drink everything, smoke everything, do whatever you want. And they said to themselves, we'll leave him on this island, and he'll become unfit to be king. So we'll solve our problem without killing him. Six months later, they come back to the island, and they look around, and Louis hadn't touched a thing. So the rebels said to this little boy, Why didn't you eat? Why didn't you drink? You had everything a kid could ever want. Why didn't you indulge? Listen to his answer. His answer is an answer that needs to resonate in our mind every single day of our life. He said, I'm sorry, I can't do what you ask. Because I was born to be a king. And a king doesn't eat and doesn't drink these things. Every single Jew, every single morning, when you wake up and you say, this is tough, this is difficult, this is challenging, the world needs it, the world wants it, and the world is convincing me that I need it too, you need to remind yourself that behind those doors isn't frightening, behind those doors is freedom, because yes, the world of chickens, they need it, but we were born to be eagles, we were born to fly, we were born and challenged to Nikadesh, we were born to live and have homes that are completely different than the world around us. So every single morning, when you look at this challenge and you read what you wrote down on that paper and what you accepted upon yourself and you say, this is difficult. And the Yetzir Hara is knocking on your door like he did to Plimo's house and he wants his way back into your house. You look him in the eye and you say, I can't do what you ask because I was born to be a king. Thank you.